You're listening to the Kirk and Tillich Herald, a Q and Review recording service podcast, brought to you by our team of volunteers currently recording from their homes across Scotland. Whether you're listening via the BWBF online players, the telephone app, or our brand new Alexa skill, please phone us on 0141 772 3976 to feedback on what you want us to provide and improve upon. Please also join your family and friends in being our audio ambassadors and share our Facebook, Twitter and Instagram all at Q and Review. That's at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W. This week's paper, the Wednesday the 25th of January 2023, is read to you by Alan, Corey, Hunter and Ian. 200 new homes. Carla Homes announced fault held development in Kirkintilloch following successful purchase of land at Market Road and Christon Road. Carla Homes West is marking a key milestone at its new fault head development in Kirkintilloch with a successful purchase of land at Market Road and Christon Road. Located adjacent to the popular Woodley Village, the new development will incorporate a total of 228 homes including 171 private homes, with options ranging from one-bedroom cottage flats, three-bedroom terrace and semi-detached homes, and four- and five-bedroom detached villas. The remaining 57 plots will deliver much-needed affordable homes to the local community. These homes will be developed in partnership with Hillhead Housing Association, a Kirkintilla-based community-run organisation. The Fallhead development is estimated to start in January 2023, with construction projected to last five years. This represents an investment of £50 million in eastern Bartonshire. Abundant green space is a key design feature of the Faldhead site, with the aim of benefiting both residents and local biodiversity. On the site, biodiversity specialists will create three new ponds and also hundreds of established and sapling trees, as well as over 4,000 square metres of hedgerow that complements the character of the surrounding area. To further enhance the biodiversity on the site, the extensive landscaping, which features a green corridor, will also be complemented with bat, bee and bird boxes to preserve local wildlife and encourage a healthy local ecosystem. Connectivity to the surrounding local area will be enhanced with a network of footpaths, providing the missing link with the Woodley Village South footpath. Commenting on the project, Ian Conway, Strategic Projects Director, Calla Holmes West, said, Calla Holmes West is delighted to have concluded the purchase of land in Faldhead. The development will provide a variety of homes to meet the needs of local buyers, including downsizers, growing families and those looking for their forever home. I'm also pleased to announce that Calla Holmes West will deliver a net biodiversity gain at this site, creating a sustainable environment for our customers to live in this vibrant new community. Having completed the purchase of the site, there will be a focus on early enabling works and welfare setup prior to construction commencing in homes, and a sales launch anticipated in winter 2023. For further information on the new site, at Faldhead and other Calla Homes West land, and planning updates, Please visit www.cala.co.uk This Week in History, read by me, Ian. January the 25th, 1924, the first Winter Olympics began at Chamonix, France. On this day last year, the parents of a teenager who died from an allergic reaction after eating a baguette received a royal honour for their campaigning efforts in the wake of her death. January 26, 1965 Hindi was made the official language of India. On this day last year, a langur monkey, a half-orange, half-grey gecko and the world's first succulent bamboo were among 224 new species in the Greater Mekong area, wildlife experts said. January 27, 1992, Jennifer Flowers accuses Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton of being a liar after he denied having a 12-year affair with her. January 27, 
January 28th, 1908, the London Playhouse Theatre opened. On this day last year, the National Trust unveiled plans for a green corridor to link the centre of Bath to the surrounding countryside and create new habitat, habitat for wildlife. January 29th, 1951, actress Elizabeth Taylor, 19, divorced her first husband, Hochelle Nair, Nicky Hilton. January the 30th, 1933, Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. Voting closes on popular play park upgrade as recorded by Hunter MacDonald. Eastern Berkshire Council is planning to upgrade its play park at Etiff Park in Bishop Briggs and local residents have been given the chance to vote for the favourite design option from designs submitted by specialist companies. Councillor Paul Ferretti, convener of the Place, Neighbourhood and Corporate Assets Committee said this popular play park has been identified for upgrade and to ensure we are offering the highest standard of quality and choice to the community we presented a variety of design options to residents. We wanted as many people as possible to take part and have their say on what's eventually constructed at each play area location. The voting was on a one vote per household basis and we had encouraged our local children to have their say. The design that has collected the most votes at the expiry of the deadline date will be the one that is installed. Residents were encouraged to consider each layout play as it gave a more accurate portrayal of what each company was providing or not providing. Voting ended on Sunday, January the 22nd, with votes cast after this deadline not counted. Each of the choices has been designed to provide exciting and challenging play equipment for children of various ages. New Year, New You sound familiar? NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde is continuing its wellbeing series to help people become fitter and healthier in 2023. One of the biggest challenges after the Christmas and New Year period is to get back on track with healthy eating. Most of us tend to relax with what we are consuming over the festive break and really want to make positive changes to our weight and health in the new year. In order to take steps in the right direction, it's helpful to consider what we should be eating and doing more of on a daily basis. Every small step can make a big difference. That is why NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde want to help people who are looking to make realistic changes to their lifestyles through their weight management services, physical activity and local cooking programmes. There are many benefits of making small changes to your lifestyle including Increased energy levels, consuming the right foods, can help boost our energy levels throughout the day. Small simple swaps like choosing diet soft drinks or a smaller fun sized chocolate bar will reduce your calorie intake. Weight loss, having a target weight you want to achieve is a great way to get started and to aid motivation. Improved mood or mental well-being. Improved sleep. Having between 7 and 9 hours sleep provides a range of health benefits, including boosting your immune system and increased productivity. Reducing the risk of several health conditions such as type 2 diabetes and heart disease. The Community Weight Management Service has grown in the last couple of years. In partnership with Weight Watchers, they now offer 93 workshops across the whole of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, and four weekly virtual workshops that are available to all who are eligible to the service. To find out more about weight management services, please visit manageyourweight-nhs Greater Glasgow and Clyde or call 0141-211-3379, Monday to Friday, 8am to 4pm. OPAT, now seven days. Report by Mora Cook. A specialist-led service which provides acute level hospital care in an outpatient capacity to patients with complex infections is playing a critical role in free- freeing crucial bed space in hospitals across NHS, Greater Glasgow and Clyde. The outpatient parentable antimicrobial, antimicrobial therapy OPAT, service 
which relaunched in January 2022, has seen more than 17,000 hospital beds avoided throughout 2022 and looks set to further increase impact in 2023 as it moved to a seven days a week service. Based at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow, but with outreach to hospitals across NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, the specialist OPAT team, which is made up of nurses, pharmacists and infectious disease consultants, can see more than 100 new referrals each month. The service treats patients with infections who require IV antibiotics, either on a short or long term basis, but who are otherwise suitable for outpatient treatment. This might include, for example, patients suffering cellulitis, which is a common skin infection, or a range of other difficult to treat infections, for example, complicating diabetes, chronic lung disease, or surgery. About one in three patients are referred direct by GPs and avoid hospital admission altogether, while two thirds, usually with more complex infection and requiring initial hospital investigations and treatment, have their hospital, hospital stays significantly shortened. For patients that require an initial inpatient stay, the time spent in hospital is shortened by an average of three weeks per patient. Dr Andrew Seaton, consultant in infection diseases and a lead for the OPAT service across NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, said, The OPAT service provides highly specialist care to patients with a range of infections. Our aim for patients is to safely avoid a hospital stay whenever possible and otherwise identify those who may benefit from a supported discharge as early as in their hospital admission as possible. Infections like cellulitis are one of the top 10 reasons for a short stay, less than one week, acute hospital admission. We are particularly focused on avoiding accident and emergency attendances and hospital admissions for this group, and we have been working closely with GPs and acute care physicians to achieve this. We are looking to further expand the OPAT service across our large health board in 2023 and ensure that anyone, whatever their needs, can avoid hospital admission or have a shorter stay as possible. Dr Scott Davison, Deputy Medical Director for Acute Services for NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, added, The work of the OPAT team has been instrumental in freeing up bed capacity for other patients requiring urgent care and has undoubtedly played a crucial role in helping us respond to pressures facing the service. It's one of a number of care inv innovations which we're investing in to help tackle challenges and a fantastic example of how our teams can work collaboratively across services to help patients avoid admissions to our assessment units and to E&E. &E. e &E. days of teacher strikes. The Educational Institute of Scotland, EIS, the country's largest teaching union, has announced 22 additional days of strike action in an escalation of the dispute over teachers' pay. This is in addition to the previously announced 16-day programme of rolling strike action, which began in schools across the country last week. EIS members have previously taken three days of national strike action, one in November and two in January, in the continuing campaign for a fair pay settlement for the year 2022. The EIS Executive Committee met and agreed a programme of additional strike action that will include two days of national strike action in all schools and sectors on February 28th and March the 1st, followed by a rolling programme of strikes for 20 days between March the 13th and April the 21st. Over the rolling strike period, each local authority area will be impacted by three consecutive days of strike action, with one day of strike action in all schools bookended on either side by one day strikes in primary and secondary schools. Commenting following the meeting of EIS Executive Committee, General Secretary Andrea Bradley said, The programme of additional strike action is a direct response to the inaction of the Scottish Government and COSLA, Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, on teacher pay. After a year of dither, delay and disingenuity from the Scottish Government and COSLA, Scotland's teachers have simply had enough. The recent days of strike action by Scotland's teachers have succeeded in bringing COSLA and the Scottish Government back to the negotiating table, but they have yet to put a single penny into that table.
Scotland's teachers rejected a sub-inflationary 5% offer six months ago and little or no progress has been made in negotiations since. The prospect of 22 additional days of strike action on top of the 16 days of rolling action should signal clearly to the Scottish Government and COSLA that they must now act with urgency. Our members are resolute and determined to secure a fair pay settlement which both properly reflects their value and also takes account of the soaring cost of living. Feedback on discharge. NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde is seeking the public's feedback and experience of being discharged from hospital. The feedback will help shape the board's approach to informing, encouraging and supporting families, patients and staff to facilitate early discharges back into a home environment from hospital. The survey forms part of the Home for Lunch initiative, which is aimed at those patients ready to go home and not reliant on any additional care services being put in place ahead of going home. The campaign seeks to highlight the benefits of being discharged as early in the day as possible, both on the patient going home and on patient flow through the rest of the hospital. NHS GGC is keen to hear from anyone who has been involved in the care discharge process to find out a little bit more about their own experience, the challenges faced in getting home, and what their wider understanding is of the benefits of a pre noon discharge. Anyone wishing to contribute should fill out the survey by January 30th. Professor Angela Wallace, Nurse Director at NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, highlighted some of the things patients should be thinking about ahead of their day of discharge. She said, We know that our patients ready to go home who have a suitable home environment waiting for them, staying in hospital any longer than required can be detrimental, particularly for elderly patients. We also know that if you are able to get home in time for lunch on your planned day of discharge, this means that we are able to help other patients who might be waiting for a bed and potentially minimise any extra time spent in A and E. That's why it's so important for us to understand what support you might need to get home. This can be as simple as having a conversation with your nursing team alongside your loved ones so we can plan your discharge together, provide any additional support if required and ensure everything goes as smoothly as possible. More information on the campaign can be found at www.nhsggc.scot forward slash your dash health forward slash person dash centred dash health dash and dash care forward slash home dash for dash lunch forward slash that's www.nhsggc.scot forward slash your dash health forward slash person dash centred dash health dash and dash care forward slash home dash for dash lunch forward slash read by alan todd early years consultation discussed by councillors councillors have discussed the findings of a consultation on early years education in eastern Bartonshire. the papers for tuesday's session of the council's education committee contained the results of the consultation, which took place between August and September last year, and saw parents and carers invited to give feedback on these services. This took place a year after the Council met its target to provide 1,140 hours of funded early learning and childcare for all three and four-year-olds and eligible two-year-olds, around 2,700 children in total. Consultation responses were received from around 16% of service users, with a further 13% of the Council's early year staff completing a questionnaire. About one in three respondents said their children used out-of-school care. During the consultation, the Council also hosted 13 focus group meetings involving staff, parents and care providers. The main reason parents gave for using these services were to allow them to work and to benefit their children's social and educational development. Respondents said they wanted clearer advice, notices of charges for places beyond 1,140 hours of funded service, 
and more information on the available options and their application process. The main differences felt by respondents using these services were reduced childcare costs, more social and educational opportunities for their children and easier time management for work or study. Commonly requested improvements to service planning included term time options, more flexible hours, funded places for children under three, greater choice of provision and reduced costs, especially if more than one child. Extended provision of Gaelic language services were also mentioned. One in three respondents said recent changes in legislation meant they would defer the date their child entered school. The most common mode of attendance, over 48%, was using funded hours in combination with a wraparound service for the extended year. Three quarters of responses expressed satisfaction with their chosen method. Those who said they were not satisfied wanted more flexibility in the available hours, the option to choose the nursery associated with the primary school their children would attend, funding for two-year-olds and more affordable childcare for wraparound services, as the cost of these sometimes forced changes to working patterns or created line reliance on family members. Among the focus group participants were parents who used the additional support needs play schemes at Merkland and Campsy View. The Merkland feedback was very, very positive, but the Campsy View group, while welcoming numerous benefits, also indicated desired improvements in areas such as communication, flexibility and the provision of after-school care. With the consultation concluded, the various findings are now undergoing reviews which will lead to several future reports. The next meeting of the Education Committee will take place on Tuesday, January 24th from 5.30pm. It will also be broadcast live on the Council YouTube channel. Airport to Pilot App Glasgow Airport is trialling an app to ensure all passengers who require additional support get the help they need. Approximately 25% of requests for special assistance are made on the day of travel and are not pre-arranged for a number of reasons. The PRM Assist app will supplement the current service, which is usually pre-arranged by the passenger via their airline or booking agent. This means that persons with reduced mobility, PRM, passengers who have been unable to book assistance with their airline, can do so using the new app, or it will allow the airport service provider, OCS, to arrange assistance for them. As well as ensuring all PRM, PRM passengers get the support they need, the app will help OCS to plan staffing and equipment levels further in advance and provide a wide range of analysis to continually approve the current service. The PRM Assist app can also provide passengers with real-time flight information, allow them to request specific sp special assistance and provide feedback, which is vitally the part of how the service is continually improved. Ronald Leach, Glasgow Airport's Operations Director, said the way in which special assistance services are delivered is constantly evolving and improving, so we can we continue to look at ways we can further develop our methods to ensure our PRM passengers enjoy a safe, dignified and enjoyable airport experience. Glasgow has one of the highest proportions of PRM passengers of any UK airport, and I firmly believe this is due to the quality of service and the significant investment we make each year. What is also vital to the success of our PRM's PRM service is the dedication and hard work of those people who deliver it for our passengers who need additional support each and every day. Derek Murphy, Director of Aviation Services OCS UK in Ireland said, OCS and our partners at Glasgow Airport are dedicated to continuously improving our PRM service provision and now we will see real benefits to both the passengers experience and the PRM operation through the implementation of PRM Assist. The PRM Assist app is available to download on both Apple and Android platforms. Lady Haig HQ reopens. Factory's Royal Official Opening. Report by Julie Curry. Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal popped into Lady Haig's Poppy Factory in Edinburgh this morning, Thursday the 19th of January, to officially reopen the campus following a two-year refurbishment. Her Royal Highness toured the factory and its new exhibition space and chatted to staff before visiting Poppy Scotland's mobile museum, Bud. The factory, 
founded in 1926, will now reopen to visitors and school groups following the project to be showcased, its history and heritage. 33 disabled veterans work in the factory on Loki Green Road, making more than 3 million poppies each year for the Scottish Poppy Appeal, as well as wreaths and other tributes. Her Royal Highness was met by the Deputy Lord Lieutenant of the City of Edinburgh, Brigadier Dr John Reed Thompson, who is also Chair of the factory. Poppy Scotland's President, Rear Admiral Mike Beverstock, Helen Owen, Chair of Poppy Scotland, and Factory Manager, Major Charlie Pelling. Helen Owen said, We are very grateful to Her Royal Highness for taking the time to meet the team involved in this exciting project, as well as her continued support for our armed forces community. The veterans enjoyed showing her how poppies and wreaths are handmade using traditional methods and explained, explaining the unique history of the factory. David Adamson, a wreath maker and tour guide who served for 22 years with the Royal Highland Fusiliers, gave her a tour of the factory, introducing the team. Mr Adamson said, She was very interested in everything and took the time to speak to as many of the guys as possible. She also noticed the big difference from last time she visited. During her visit, she spent time talking to the veterans about their experiences and the different stages of making poppies and wreaths. She signed a reflection postcard, which will form part of a wall display in the factory and unveiled a plaque to commemorate the occasion. Her Royal Highness then toured Bud, the 18-ton truck which transformed into a micro-museum that has now travelled to every local authority in Scotland. Poppy Scotland's director, Austin Hardy, said, We were honoured to welcome the Princess Royal to officially reopen our newly refurbished factory and campus. This is a culmination of two years of hard work to ensure we have a modern facility dedicated to supporting Scotland's veterans community. We are very proud of our heritage, and this marks an exciting new chapter in the factory's 97-year history. We are looking forward to welcoming school groups and the wider public to the factory and the exhibition space, telling the story of the poppy to new generations. To find out more about Lady Haig's Poppy Factory or book a tour, visit www.poppyscotland.org.uk slash lady hyphen Haig's hyphen poppy hyphen factory. It's nearly a hundred years Lady Haig's Poppy Factory was founded in 1926 by Lady Haig, wife of the Field Marshal. Originally established in the grounds of Whiteford House, the factory is now located on Morrison Road, Edinburgh. In the beginning, the poppies were made by two ex-servicemen, a pair of scissors and some tissue paper. Now a team of around 34 disabled veterans produce 3 million poppies for the Scottish Poppy Appeal each year. They also produce 10,000 wreaths, 60,000 remembrance symbols, 40,000 long stem, stem poppies, and other associated remembrance items. For more information, visit www.poppyscotland.org.uk. Westminster Notes by Amy Callahan MP. We must stand shoulder to shoulder with our workers. Rishi Sunak is waging war on workers and on Holyrood. Faced with strikes across the public sector, the UK government has introduced and rushed through an anti-workers bill that gives bosses the power to sack striking workers and sue trade unions, instead of getting around the table and negotiating with trade unions as the Scottish government has done. This is just the latest attack on workers' rights. From Thatcher through Major, Cameron and now Sunak, the Tories have introduced six acts designed to reduce the power of trade unions and limit our rights. Sunak has also launched a full frontal attack on the Scottish Parliament and, in effect, on devolution. The UK government has enacted a Section 35 order to prevent Holyrood's Gender Recognition Reform Bill from receiving royal assent. Whatever your views on that bill, this move should worry us all. This is a law created by our democratically elected Parliament on an area of policy that is devolved to Scotland, being stopped by a Tory government in London that we haven't voted for since 1959. It is an unprecedented attack on democracy and devolution. If the UK government can stop this legislation, then what next? 
That is before we even get to the terrible impact this political game has on trans people, who deserve the less invasive route to a gender recognition certificate that the GRR would provide. The only way to stop this continued erosion of our rights is for Scotland to become an independent country. The last few weeks have shown that we can't trust any government at Westminster to have our best interests at heart. Under the current system, we must listen to Sunak tell us that public sector pay demands are unreasonable and that a bill within the competency of the Scottish Parliament cannot be enacted on nothing more than a Tory say-so. The false pretenses that the anti-strike bill has been introduced under, under are absurd and unfounded. Our workers are the public and they demand better. We must stand shoulder to shoulder with them and the trans community. We must call it the affront to democracy that is both the anti-strike bill and the imposition of a Section 35 order. And that was this week's Westminster Notes by Amy Callahan, MP. House prices drop more than Scottish average. House prices dropped by 1.3%, more than the average for Scotland in Eastern Bartonshire in November, new figures show. But the drop does not reverse the longer term trend which has seen property prices in the area grow by 8.1% over the last year. The average Eastern Bartonshire house price in November was £271,621, land registry figures show, a 1.3% decrease on October. Over the month, the picture was similar to that across Scotland, where prices decreased 1.2% and Eastern Bartonshire was lower than the 0.3% drop for the UK as a whole. Over the last year, the average sale price of property in Eastern Bartonshire rose by £20,000, putting the area 13th among Scotland's 32 local authorities with price data for annual growth. The highest annual growth in the region was in Nahelmanshire, where property prices increased on average by 26.9% to £164,000. At the other end of the scale, Properties in Aberdeen lost 4.7% of their value, giving an average price of £140,000. The average UK house price edged down to £295,000 in November 2022, from the previous month's record high of £296,000. Property prices increased by 10.3% in the year to November, slowing from 12.4% in October. Commenting Nathan Emerson, CEO of Property Mark, which represents estate agents, said, In November, our agents reported a market that was on the cusp of seeing purchasing power handed back to buyers, which was a trend we hadn't seen in months. Roger Evans, director of Home Finance Distribution at Gatehouse Bank, said, The property market is slowly becoming more favourable for buyers in some areas as rates stabilise a little following the turbulence of 2022. First-time buyers in Eastern Bartonshire spent an average of £200,000 on their property, £15,000 more than a year ago and £46,000 more than in November 2017. By comparison, former owner-occupiers paid £324,000 on average in November, 62.1% more than first-time buyers. Owners of flats saw the biggest fall in property prices Eastern Bartonshire in November, They dropped 2.1% in price to £142,057 on average. But after the last year, prices rose by 5.1%. Among other types of property, detached, down 0.7% monthly, up 9.3% annually, £493,476 average. Semi-detached, down 1.3% monthly, up 8.7% annually, £284,499 average. Terraced, down 1.4% monthly, up 9.5% annually, £204,979 average. Buyers paid 41.8% more than the average prices in Scotland, £191,000, in November for a property in Eastern Bartonshire. Across Scotland, property prices are high compared to those across the UK, 
with the average cost £295,000. The most expensive properties in Scotland were in Edinburgh, £334,000 on average and 1.2 times as much as more. 1.2 times as much more than in Eastern Bartonshire. Edinburgh properties cost 2.6 times as much as homes in Inverclyde, £127,000 on average, at the other end of the scale. The highest property prices across the UK were in Kensington and Chelsea. Family Announcements Deaths Beg David McKay David, aged 72, of Dollar and formerly of Hong Kong and Lindsay, peacefully died at home after a lung illness on January 17th, 2023. Dearly loved husband of Fiona, much loved and loving father of Colin, Alison, and father-in-law to Claire and Sam. He was a devoted and proud papa to his grandchildren, Lilana, Zara, Cameron, and Jordi. A funeral service will take place at Falkirk Crematorium on Saturday, February 4th, 2023, at 11.15am. All friends and family are respectfully invited. Family flowers only. Donations, if desired, to Strathcairn Hospice, Roy and McIntyre Funeral Home, Glen Ockle, 01259 Five. Bell Allen Peacefully at Glasgow Royal Infirmary on Monday, January 2nd, 2023. Allen, beloved husband of the late Faye, much loved father of Duncan, Susan, and Colin, and a loving grandpa. Funeral service private. No flowers, please. Conway Father William. Peacefully at Glasgow Royal Infirmary on December 26th, 2022. Former priest at St. Mackin's RC Church, Lennox Town. Fortified by rites of the Holy Catholic Church, RIP. Reception and vigil at St. Mackin's RC Church on Thursday, January 26th, 2023 at 7pm. Funeral Mass on Friday, January 27th, 2023, at 12.30pm, and thereafter to High Park Cemetery. Graham Kathleen Sadly, after a short illness at Glasgow Royal Infirmary on January 16th, 2023. Kathleen, beloved wife of Stuart, much-loved mum to Paul and Jennifer, a loving grandma to Lauren. Holly and Chloe. Funeral service to take place on Friday, January 27th, 2023 at Daldowie Crematorium, Broom Hill, arriving at 9.30am. No flowers, please. Donations will be gratefully received after the service in aid of Macmillan's nurses. Johnson, Thomas. Suddenly, after a long illness at Glasgow Royal Infirmary on Tuesday, January 20th, 2023. Thomas, dear brother of William, funeral service to take place on Friday, February 3rd, 2023, at G&D Lawson Funeral Directors, Kirk and Talk, in their Lawson's Chapel at 10.30am and thereafter to Campsie Cemetery. Smith. Archibald, brackets, Archie. Much loved husband of the late Chrissy, father, papa, and great papa, died peacefully, surrounded by his family on January 3rd, 2023, at Craig and Goyne Care Home, aged 96. Funeral service will be held on Wednesday, February 1st, 2023, at St. Mary's Church, Kirk and Talk, at 1 pm followed by cremation at Falkirk Crematorium at 2.30pm. Sadly, missed. Family Fund can help with costs. Families on a low income in Scotland, raising disabled or seriously ill children and young people, have the chance to receive timely help with higher costs of living. Families with children up to the age of 18 
are being urged to reach out for support now from National Charity Family Fund to help ease pressures caused by rocketing prices this winter. It costs three times as much to raise a disabled child and families often face severely reduced income as they provide the round-the-clock care their children need. Family Fund, the UK's largest grant-making charity for families with disabled and seriously ill children and young people, provides essential grants for items ranging from clothing and bedding to white goods, furniture and appliances. For the full list, visit www.familyfund.org.uk forward slash grants dash what dash can dash we dash apply dash for. That's www.familyfund.org.uk dot uk forward slash grants dash what dash can dash we dash apply dash for. More than 8,000 families in Scotland received grants and services last year. Families are asked to apply as soon as possible at www.familyfund.org.grants apply to gain support whilst it is available thanks to ongoing funding from the Scottish Government. Grants have helped families like that of seven-year-old Amea from Glasgow who has autism. The family has granted the family was granted an iPad, which has helped to calm her and develop her communication through video and creative play. Her mother, Anissa, said, "The iPad gives Amea some space in her own little world. The difference it's made to her is unbelievable." Family Fund delivered over one hundred and seventy thousand nine hundred and nineteen grants and services across the UK worth over £37 million to families on low incomes in the past year. As winter months progress, this is timely help, as a recent cost of caring report by Family Fund shows that 9 in 10 families on a low income raising disabled children are struggling or falling behind with their regular household bills, and many are forced to forgo living essentials such as food, heating, basic furniture like beds, flooring, washing machines and fridges to try to make ends meet. Cheryl Ward, Chief Executive, said, Families bringing up a disabled or seriously ill child on a low income are under intense pressure currently as energy prices and wider living costs remain untenably high. We want families living in Scotland to know that Family Fund is here for support and we urge people to apply as soon as possible to get this help with essential household items. Eligible families in Scotland are encouraged to apply as soon as possible by visiting Grants Scotland Family Fund or calling 01904 550 055. That's 01904 550 055. Family Fund is the UK's largest grant-making charity for disabled and seriously ill children and young people, established in 1973. For more information, on who can help, who can receive help, visit www.familyfund.org.uk. That's www.familyfund.org.uk. Kirkwood Telecom Bishop Briggs Herald Letters page. Let's talk. Please send your letters via email to kirkyherald at gnscotland.co.uk and write letters in the subject field. Please keep letters to a maximum of 300 words. Letters cannot be published without a name and postal address. Also include a daytime phone number if possible. We reserve the right to edit any letter. Confected Outrage Sir, Nicola Sturgeon's carefully confected outrage at Alistair Jack's invoking of Section 35 of the Scotland Act of 1998 against the Gender Recognition Reform Bill may have impressed her Green allies and sundry supporters of the bill. It has, however, been met with relief by many who campaigned against this bill. Above all, there has been no significant groundswell of popular support for it. Having used the Supreme Court once to try to stir up support for a referendum, no doubt Ms Sturgeon will resort to the law once more. I have no idea how generally invested she is in the green slash Stonewall campaign on gender self-ID but I am in no doubt that uncompromising stance on the most controversial aspects of the bill have more to do with creating a standoff with the UK government. 
it could all have been so different if the SNP had not positioned itself as the permanent opposition to the UK government. Discussion between them of the issues, especially where they impinge on the Equalities Act, should have taken place, but for Miss Sturgeon and her allies, the confrontational approach is generally the first resort. This issue is indeed momentous. The implications for women and girls in their safe spaces are a matter of deep concern. Yet, for the SNP, this is overwhelmingly just the next stage of their long war of attrition to try to break up the UK. Yours etc. Jill Stevenson, by email. Democracy being denied, sir, while some seem content to along with the UK government line that invoking a Section 35 order is necessary to avoid legislative conflict over gender recognition in the UK, others question why the UK government has been so slow to introduce necessary reform of its own GR legislation. Those who claim this is not an attempt to politically exploit the current predicament of a disadvantaged minority of the population should also question why it is apparently acceptable for those benefiting from similar reforms in other countries to conduct their lives in accordance with their new identity in England, but those that would be coming from Scotland would need to be considered differently. What is evident is that a Tory UK government will do everything in its power to emasculate the Scottish Parliament and even, in a devolved matter, will attempt to block a bill overwhelmingly supported by Scottish Labour and Lib Dems as well as the SNP and Greens. Not only is Scottish parliamentary democracy being denied, devolved government from Holyrood, introduced with the backing of the vast majority of the, the voting Scottish electorate, is day by day being neutered by an authoritarian right-wing government at Westminster. With more of our individual rights set to be extinguished and further doubling down on the Brexit catastrophe, it is imperative that those who today have sat in the constitutional sidelines now speak out and demonstrate to de facto Governor Alistair Jack that not only is there a strong desire in Scotland for our country to be in the European Union, there is an undeniable right of the people of Scotland to determine their own destiny. Yours etc. Stan Grodzineski. Address applies. Electric car price shock. Sir. Tesla has thrown the EV market into confusion by reducing the cost of three types of electric car vehicles by £7,000, £8,000 and £9,000. My heart goes out to anyone who bought their electric car a day or two before this astounding announcement and it can't be welcome knowledge to those trying to sell their second-hand EV. It also highlights the profits being made. If the maker can reduce the prices so much and still make a profit. Yours etc. Archibald E. Lowry by email. A danger to royal family. Sir. Prince Harry is becoming a danger to the royal family, providing so much detailed information in his book about the internal layout of royal residences. It could be used by intruders. At the same time, he expresses paranoid, unwanted views about the future upbringing of William's children, including their safety. Is he too dim to recognise the significance of his actions? The royal family must now have reservations about him, Harry, attending the coronation, in case he collects and divulges private conversations in yet another book. Surely this level of public exposure by Harry and unwanted warranty pressure on the royal family has to be stopped, if only for reasons of security. Yours etc. Leslie Housen, address supplied. Help to make your community bloom. Communities involved in projects to improve their local neighbourhoods are being invited to join over 200 groups working with environmental charity Keep Scotland Beautiful. Registration for two long-standing environmental improvement initiatives, Beautiful Scotland and It's Your Neighbourhood, is now open until April 30th and there is no cost to take part. These initiatives aim to encourage and inspire community action and feed into the Royal Horticultural Society, RHS, UK-wide Britain in Bloom campaign. Beautiful Scotland is for groups which have come together to improve their whole village, town or city and has judged and non-judged categories with prestigious awards up for grabs. It's Your Neighbourhood is for smaller scale projects such as Community Garden, a Friends of Park group or a group of neighbours improving their street or a nearby green space. It isn't a competition but has levels of achievement to encourage progression. 
Groups which register for either initiative will receive support, mentoring and recognition for their ongoing greening and growing efforts throughout the year and have opportunities to nominate themselves for a range of awards. While shrubs, flowers and trees are an important part of an entry, there is also a significant focus on environmental biodiversity and climate change issues, such as reducing water use, planting for wildlife and repurposing or recycling, as well as addressing litter, graffiti and improving vacant properties or sites. Juliet Camborn, Keep Scotland Beautiful Community Projects Officer, said, It is becoming increasingly important to focus action on climate change and take positive steps to protect and enhance biodiversity in communities. Volunteers across Scotland make a huge contribution to the essential work being done to tackle the climate and nature emergency we are facing, helping make Scotland clean, green and sustainable for nature and people. We'd love people from well-established groups through to those just starting out to register for free support and recognition through the Beautiful Scotland or It's Your Neighbourhood initiatives this year, joining a network of passionate people all over the country. Groups are expected to find ways of involving the wider community throughout the year, through activities such as fundraising events and linking up with others. This year, there is an optional theme of health and well-being to focus activities and events around. Last year, volunteers across the country contributed almost 200,000 hours, equating to an economic value of over £2.5 million. Keep Scotland Beautiful through its Beautiful Scotland and It's Your Neighbourhood initiatives supports and gives international recognition to many thousands of volunteers who get out there and make a real difference to their local areas. For more information, visit the Beautiful Scotland and It's Your Neighbourhood pages at www.keepscotlandbeautiful.org That's www.keepscotlandbeautiful.org where a map also shows where groups are already working across the country. At Home Rehab is the way forward. An award-winning cardiac rehabilitation programme which helps people living with heart failure improve their quality of life from the convenience and safety of their own homes should be rolled out across Scotland. That's the view of a new study led by researchers at the University of Glasgow. The Scott Reach HF study followed more than 100 people with heart failure in Scotland as they participated in the REACH HF programme. Results show that the programme not only helped heart failure patients improve their quality of life, but it was also an affordable method of rehabilitation care within Scotland's NHS. As a home-based programme, REACH HF also offers an alternative for patients to participate in the rehabilitation without having to attend classes in a hospital setting, which can be inconvenient, time-consuming and involve travel costs. Around 1 million people in the UK have heart failure. It means that the heart is unable to function efficiently, causing debilitating symptoms such as fatigue, shortness of breath and a dangerous accumulation of fluid. Dr Carrie Purcell, lead author of the study from the University of Glasgow said, as a homes-based programme, that can provide remote support from healthcare professionals, we knew REACH HF could overcome many of the obstacles that prevent people with heart failure taking part in hospital-based programmes. Through this study, we have now also shown that the programme can improve the quality of life and health of people with heart failure and be delivered in a cost-effective way in the NHS in Scotland. Building picture of squirrel population Participants of the 2022 Great Scottish Squirrel Survey have helped build a better picture of red and grey squirrel distributions across Scotland. Members of the public helped contribute significantly to red squirrel conservation by reporting sightings during the annual Great Scottish Squirrel Survey Week last October. This was the fourth year of the survey, which, which directly influences work carried out by Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels, a project led by the Scottish Wildlife Trust that's been going for the last 14 years to help save the species. A total of 69, 659 people took part, with 255 grey squirrels and 510 red squirrel sightings reported in total, 
more than triple the number of sightings reported in a typical week. The survey confirmed that the red-only population of the Highlands remains safe and free of grey squirrels. Concerted work in Aberdeen has also been very successful, with reds returning and grey numbers significantly decreasing in the city. In South Scotland, a mix of the two species remains, but volunteers are working hard to keep numbers of the grey squirrels low in this region. Nicole Still, Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels Programme Manager, said, We are deeply grateful to all volunteers and members of the public for submitting their sightings. Sightings of both species are vital as we work across the country, collaborating with partners and stakeholders to help save the iconic red squirrel from its main threat, the non-native grey squirrel. We strongly encourage people to continue to report sightings. It can make a big difference. All sightings can be reported at scottishsquirrels.org.uk slash squirrel hyphen sightings. Eagle-eyed Scots are needed now. Report by Julie Curry. The world's largest garden wildlife survey returns this weekend, with hundreds of thousands of people watching and counting the UK's garden birds for the RSPB's Big Garden Bird Watch. More than 44,000 people took part in Scotland in 2022, counting over 830,000 birds. This year's event runs from January the 27th to 29th. People are asked to spend just one hour watching and recording the birds in their garden, balcony or local park, then send their results to the RSPB. This year marks the 44th Big Garden Bird Watch. Starting in 1979, it has since become a much-loved annual event that helps give the RSPB a valuable snapshot of how our garden birds are doing. Over that time, 172 million birds have been counted and nearly 11 million hours spent watching garden birds. Anne McCall, RSPB Scotland Director, said, To help nature, we must first understand it. Big Garden Bird Watch is when we all come together to help build a picture of how our wild birds are doing. With the climate and nature crisis unfolding around us, it is more important than ever to grow, and, to grow that understanding. You do not have to be an expert. Anyone can join in and all of the information is useful. If you don't have a garden, visit your nearest park or green space or simply spend an hour looking out from your window or, bar- or balcony. Last year, we found out that the greenfinch, a species that had been struggling, may be beginning to recover. We also recorded a welcome increase in the beautiful goldfinch. Perhaps most importantly, everyone taking part stepped back from everyday stresses and spent an hour simply focusing on the wildlife around them. Everyone can benefit from that. Why not join us this year? The house sparrow remained at the top of the Big Garden Birdwatch rankings as the most commonly seen garden bird in 2022, with more than 14,000 recorded in Scotland and 1.7 million UK sightings. Starling was in second place, while the blue tit completed the top three. To register for your free Big Garden Bird Watch guide, which includes a bird identification chart, text BIRD to 70030 or visit www.rspb.org.uk slash birdwatch. National Protest to Halt Strikes Bill The Scottish TUC has called a mass rally and protest on February the 1st in opposition to the UK Tory government's strikes bill. The rally, taking place in Glasgow Trades Hall at 7pm, is part of the National Day of Action called by the TUC to reject Tory plans to introduce further restrictions on the right to strike for workers engaged in industrial action. Rail unions, the RMT and ASLEF, civil service union PCS, and education unions EIS and UCU have announced strike days for February the 1st. Hundreds of thousands of workers will take action. Disputes also continue across the postal, rail networks and the health service. STUC General Secretary Rose Foyer said, This is another vicious piece of Tory legislation designed to put workers back in their box and strip us of our right to bargain. They are trying to silence ordinary workers, but our entire movement is united. 25th of January 2023 District News Churches Home Church, Scotland, Lammermoor Road, Kirkintilloch, 
G66 4GP. The Lord is great and greatly to be praised. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 25. One church, four locations. Kirkendilloch, Glasgow, Stornoway and online. A church for all ages. Week of worship beginning on Monday, January the 23rd at 7pm. Saturdays. Warm space, warm welcome at home church every Saturday at 6.30pm. Sunday, January the 29th. 9.30am communion service. 10am prayer meeting followed by refreshments. 11am worship service, children's church, creche, followed by refreshments. The service in Glasgow is now at 3.30pm. Transport leaves home church at 3pm. Homes group recommence in February. See Facebook and Instagram for up-to-date information. Kirk and Tell Church of God at Regent Hall, Regent Street, every Wednesday, our coffee corner is open from noon to 2pm for home baking and coffee. Join our friends and neighbours for a chat over coffee. On Sunday, there will be a Zoom service at 6.30pm. The speaker will be Dr Carol Smith. A warm invitation to everyone who is able to join us on Zoom. Access details for the stream can be obtained by emailing hello at regenthall.org. For up-to-date and further information on our services, visit our website on www.regenthall.org. The Bible says, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. 1 John 5 verse 11 St David's Memorial Park Church At St David's Memorial Park Church, our Sunday morning service on January the 29th will be at 10.30am. All are welcome to attend our service. Our Tuesday lunchtime service will be held each Tuesday from noon in our small hall. Our next service will be January the 31st. All are welcome to attend this afternoon service. Our guild will also meet on January the 31st from 7.30pm until 9pm. Again, you are warmly invited to come along to the church. The church has commenced with a warm space event. This will continue on Mondays in 2023. The church will be open from noon to 4pm. All are welcome to come along. Volunteers are needed to support this event. If you can offer some time and support, please contact the church through the Facebook page. St James Church, Hilton Road, Bishop Briggs. Rector Reverend Canon Paul Wilson on 0141 230 4080. That's the Reverend Canon Paul Watson on 0141 230 4080. On Saturday, January the 28th, we are holding an informal Burns evening in the hall from 6pm. If you would like to join us, do contact our rector with your, cho- rector with your choice of a fish or haggis supper. Total costs £7 to be paid at the door. There is a communion service in the chapel on Thursday, January the 26th and on Sunday, January the 29th at 9am. The 10.30am communion service with hymns on Sunday is in the church. Face masks, a personal choice. Everyone is welcome to come along to any of these services. Our Bishop, Right Reverend Kevin Pearson, will be taking the service on Sunday, January 29th, and joining us for tea and coffee and cake in the church afterwards. Do stay and join us for this fellowship. The Meditation Labyrinth is still available in the car park for a mindful walk round. There are also virtual services in groups. For up-to-date and further information, refer to our social media, Facebook, St James LS Bishop Briggs, website www.stjamesbishopbriggs.org.uk Colston Wellpack Church A warm welcome awaits you at Colston Wellpack Church at our morning service at 11am, led by Reverend Leslie Grieve. Tea and coffee served after the service. The Colston Art Club is on this Monday from 10am to 1pm. All budding artists will be made welcome and, if interested, phone 07709 584 680 for further information. Cake and Company continues this Wednesday from 11am to 12.30pm. Come along for some friendly chat and warm companionship. The food bank is open every Friday from 11am to 1pm and 2pm to 4pm. And, as it continues its great work, and especially at this time, a special thanks to all who continually donate and give of their time. 
follow our church services on Facebook, at sign, Colton Wilpark Parish Church. And if you require further information on any of our church activities, contact Leslie Grieve on 07813 255052. St Mary's Parish Church. The service on Sunday, January the 29th will begin at 11am and be taken by the Reverend Dr Ruth Morrison. Wednesday welcome will take place as usual on Wednesday, January the 25th. The church will be open from 9am when a hot drink and home baking will be available. There will be a short service beginning at 11.30am. In February, the monthly open days and re- days resume and the first is on Wednesday, February the 8th. The church will be open from 10.30am to 3.30pm. Hot drinks are available all day. Springfield Cambridge Church Morning worship on Sunday, January the 29th will be led by Reverend Ian Taylor and Mrs Julie Harty in the sanctuary at 11am. The Sunday school meets in room 2. There is also a crèche facility where we will be happy to look after your child, birth to 3 years, in room 2. Morning worship has also been live streamed on the Springfield Cambridge Church YouTube channel. A link to this can be found on the Springfield Cambridge Church website www.springfieldcambridge.org.uk and Facebook page where up-to-date information about events and church organisations can also be found. On Sunday, January the 29th, the Sunday School will be serving rolls and sausage, tea and coffee after church in the Cameron Hall. From Sunday, January the 29th, tickets, donation price £10, will be available for members of the fundraising group in the Hall of Fellowship for the Quiz and Fish Supper Night, taking place on Saturday, February the 18th. The fundraising group are offering you the chance to win a pamper hamper as a gift for yourself or a friend. The hamper will be on display beside the entry slips in the Hall of Fellowship on Sunday, January the 29th. There will be a vestry hour on Wednesday, January the 25th, from 10am to 11am for anyone wishing to talk with the minister. There will be a short weekly service of worship in the Springfield Chapel on Wednesday, January the 25th, from 11.10am to 11.30am, after which tea and coffee will be available in the Hall of Fellowship. Hairstains Baptist Church Hairstains Baptist Church and Community Centre invite you to join them on Tuesday evenings from 6pm to come into our warm space. You can enjoy a bowl of homemade soup, a bread roll, tea and coffee and biscuits. Chat with others from the local community, play games and make new friends. The centre is in the grounds of the Hairstains Primary School, G66 2SA. We look forward to welcoming you. Lindsay Old Parish Church Sunday worship begins in the church at 11am. There is a Sunday school for children aged 3 years to primary 7 and focus for secondary pupils. A creche is available for children under 3. Ladies are invited to time out on Monday, January the 30th at 7.45pm. The guest speaking will be Ewan MacDonald, discussing a researcher's take on pandemics. Thursday Club meets on Thursday, February the 2nd at 2pm in the church hall. Enjoy tea and coffee and home baking, followed by a game of Scrabble, Dominoes, Roomy Cub or Uno. All welcome. Scottish country dancing is on Thursdays at 7.30pm in the church hall. Benefit from a gentle form of exercise for body and mind. Milton of Campsie Church. Time to pray is at 7.15pm. The fellowship meets at Haston Golf Club for a burn supper. BB Anchor and Junior Sections are at 6.15pm on Friday. Thanks to all who sent in pictures of water. Next Sunday's topic is family. Send us a picture of a human, church or animal family. Making sense of membership is from 12.30pm to 2pm, lunch and discussion. It's the last Sunday of the month, so please bring your donations for the food bank. Warm Spaces Hub is on Monday at 1pm. To volunteer and or for more information, contact Anne Pert, annepert56 at gmail.com or 01360 313 003. Also on Mondays, Baby and Toddler Group at 9.45am, Hobbies Club at 2pm, 
Badminton Club at 7.30pm. Advanced notice of min Minionissimo Go Mad Extra. Sunday, February the 5th from 1pm to 3pm for children of all ages. Drop form registration is now online. Lenzie Union Parish Church. The coffee pot is open on Fridays 10am until noon in the new hall for teas, coffee and chat. The drop-in youth cafe on Thursdays 3.45pm until 5pm is a place where young people can hang out, relax and have a good time after a long day at school. Each week there is a free snack with lots of different things to do such as games consoles, table tennis, arts and craft, board games and more. Sunday January the 29th is Super Sunday when worship will be led by the elders at 11am. A soup lunch will be served in the new hall after the service. Donations from the soup lunch will go to Crossreach. Kenmuir Parish Church. Starting at 11am, our Sunday service will be led by Jim Wright. The service will be live streamed on YouTube and can be found by searching for Kenmuir Bishop Briggs. Our warm welcome hub is open on Fridays from noon until 3pm providing a warm, safe place with free hot soup, coffee, tea, etc. This is open to all, not just members of the congregation. Details of all of our groups that are currently running may be found on our website kemure-church.co.uk To find us on Facebook, just search for Kemure Parish Church. If you would like to join our WhatsApp group or receive the Bible studies from ABC, then email us at kemurechurch at icloud.com District News General 25th of January 2023 Citizens Advice Bureau Meeting East Lombardonshire Citizens Advice Bureau give notice of their annual general and public meeting to be held virtually on Friday, February the 10th at 2pm. Please contact us on 0141 775 3220 or by email bureau at to receive the Zoom meeting link. Nominations to the trustee board from interested parties welcomed. Scottish Registered Charity SCO 23348 Career opportunity New recruits needed at Stagecoach Come and join us Stagecoach, the country's biggest bus and coach operator, has launched a search for a team of new graduates to join its UK-wide business from September. Applications have opened for 10 people to join its two-year extensive graduate training programme. Successful ap applicants will have an opportunity to learn the bus and coach business inside out, with time spent bus and coach operator on the hunt for new graduates in operations, engineering, financial, marketing and commercial departments at a range of locations up and down the country from Inverness to Exeter. The programme is part of Stagecoach's strategy to develop its future managers and leaders and Stagecoach is working with Sanctuary Graduates, the UK's leading graduate recruitment agency, who work with over 200 universities in the UK and Europe. As part of, this, of its sustainability strategy, Stagecoach is committed to fostering a diverse and inclusive workforce that targets 40% of females in leadership roles with 25% of the workforce identifying as being from ethnic minorities by 2026. Stagecoach was the first public transport organisation to offer a flagship driver apprenticeship scheme, as well as an industry-leading engineering apprenticeship programme, and, during 2022, received recognition as a top 100 apprenticeship employer. It also offers a trade-up scheme, giving existing employees the opportunity to undertake an apprenticeship with the engineering team, and are hoping to develop this even further. A number of Stagecoach's senior team started life in its graduate scheme, with a total of one regional director, five managing directors, and ten other directors successfully completing the scheme before progressing their career through the business. The next Stagecoach Graduate Leadership Programme starts in September 2023, and applications need to be submitted by February 27th, at employers.sanctuarygraduates.co.uk slash stagecoach slash hashtag benefits. Details are on the website, but the requirements are a 2-2 degree or above in any discipline by September 2023. A 
a full UK slash EU driving license by September 2023, and a good level of personal resilience and zest for learning. Visit employers.sanctuarygraduates.co.uk slash stagecoach. Celebrate Burns Night. For Burns Night Night today, January the 25th, the National Tourism Organisation Visit Scotland has teamed up with Scottish acting legend James Cosmo MBE to recite Scotland's favourite Scots poem, as voted but for by a thousand Scots. Whether singing a cheeky Scots street song or reciting all Scots poetry, most Scots will have some recollection of the Scots language from their school days. Visit Scotland surveyed a thousand Scottish adults to uncover precisely which Scots poems are their favourites, how they felt about learning Scots poetry at school. Two amounts is voted as Scotland's favourite Burns poem. Visit www.visitscotland.com slash blog slash culture slash Scots hyphen language hyphen poems. Out of town. Music by Brahms headlines Mogai Music Club's February concert at Cairns Church on Friday, February the 17th. In a delightful programme that is a real journey of discovery, leading British clarinet player Robert Plain is joined by the internationally acclaimed Gold Piano Trio in a fascinating evening of music for clarinet, violin, cello and piano. The Piano Trio in C minor by Brahms is a chamber music classic but much less well known as the music of a composer who was much admired by Brahms, the Viennese Walter Rabel, who is almost unknown to most music lovers nowadays. He left very little music, having stopped composing at the age of 30, but his quartet for clarinet and piano trio is a real masterpiece. The group will also play music by Amy Beach, who is emerging as America's leading classical composer in the 1890s after a long struggle for recognition for women com- composers. Her strong, passionate personality shines through her trio in A minor. Tickets for the concert are available online, www.mulgaimusic.org, at the Honeybee Cafe in Mulgai, and at the door. More students in university. The latest higher education student statistics show the number of Scottish domiciled students studying at Scotland's universities rose from 180,107 to 2022-21, to 183,025 in 2021-22. to There was also a record number of full-time Scottish domiciled first degree entrants recorded, with 5,595 Scots from Scotland's most deprived areas entering university. This is a 41% increase since the establishment of the Commission on Widening Access. Scottish universities also saw a record number of students qualifying in 2021-22, increasing by over 13% from 82,850 in 2022-21 to 93,775 a year later. Higher and further Education Minister Jamie Hepburn said, It is usually encouraging to see a record number of Scottish domicile students taking advantage of the world-class universities on our doorstep. These figures demonstrate the continued strength of our university sector. We continue to make progress to widen access, with a record number of students from Scotland's most deprived communities securing a place at university. We are committed to the principle that access to education should be based on the ability to learn. Every child growing up in Scotland should have an equal chance of attending university, regardless of their background and circumstances. The sharp drop in EU students coming to Scotland's universities It's bitterly disappointing, an inevitable consequence of the UK government's hugely damaging Brexit. PZ bounce back to win 2-1. An article by Brian Yule and read by me, Corey. Peters Hill bounced back from losing 7-1 to Beath as they won 2-1 at home to Cumnock on Saturday in the WOS Premier League. The home side took the lead five minutes before the break with a left foot screamer from 25 yards by Jordan Marshall. However, they were pegged back right on the stroke of half time when Greg Ferry scored an equaliser for Cumnock. Peter Sill retook the lead on 52 minutes when Dell Hepburn 
was sent clear down the left and he chipped it over the keeper for Craig Quinn to bundle home what proved to be the winner. Peter Sill were due to travel to Glen Afton last midweek, but the game was called off due to frost and snow at Lock Park, so they will try again tonight, brackets Wednesday, and then they are at Auchinleck Talbot on Saturday. Kirk and Tullock Rob Roy's trip to Pollock on Saturday was called off on Saturday. And it was their turn to visit Glen Afton this week. They have boosted their squad with the arrivals of midfielder Sean Dixon, who was a free agent, and defender Finlay Anderson from Cambus Lang Rangers. Rossville visit to Cumbernauld United in the first division also fell victim to a frozen pitch. They head to Yoker Athletic tonight in the rearranged WOS League Cup tie, before hosting Johnson Borough in the league on Saturday. Ashfield beat Glasgow University for 3 in the second division, with a double from Bobby Barr and for the strikes from Jordan Perry and Johnny Black. Glasgow Perthshire match at home to Craig Mark was off. They are away to Muirkirk on Saturday while Ashfield are at Clyseith Rangers. Rossville Academy beat Campbell Town Pupils 3-2 in the 4th Division, but West Park United's visit to Thorne Athletic also fell victim to the weather. Academy face a return fixture at Campbelltown on Saturday and West Park host Ellington. The article was written by Brian Yule and read by me, Corey. Brown targeting elusive championship victory. An article by Brian Yule and read by me, Corey. Winning the championship for Glasgow Tigers continues to be the priority for team boss Cammy Brown after a going close so many times. The Tigers have reached the playoff every season under the ownership of the Fasena family since 2014. In that time, they have won a KO Cup, Pairs and Championship Riders Championship. But despite three grand final appearances, the title continues to elude them. Brown has put together a team he is confident has the right mix of youth and experience to change that. He told the Tigers website it was always on the back burner that Chris brackets, Harris would come back if he proved to us that he wasn't on the way down. He proved totally last year that he's still a top class rider in the championship and an excellent number one. It was also a priority to keep Tom brackets, Brennan and Ben brackets, Basso both of them were highly sought after. I think Tom had about eight offers. I'm also delighted that he's taken on the club captaincy. Last season, he came out of himself when he was made captain. I also thought he rode better with more responsibility. Likewise, to keep Ben was huge for the club. His improvement last season was sensational. This year, we'll also see the return to Ashfield of Klaus Vissing and Marcin Nowak, who have both featured in losing grand finals for the Tigers in 2019 and 2021. Brown added, I think the really interesting part of the team is the second strings, number two and number four. We have brought back Klaus, and if he can recapture the form of 2019, we have an absolute steal on our hands, on five points average. Marcin told me last time he raced for us in 2021 that he wanted to come back for a full season. He's bringing his best equipment and can't wait to get here. I'm blown away that he's given up other commitments to be with us. Perhaps the biggest shock signing came at reserve. Brown continued. Lee Complin was a big powerful bodybuilder, but he's super lean now. He has new engines and a full-time mechanic. He is 100% committed to making this work at Glasgow. 
It's a gamble, but I'm confident that we will see him do better than the four-point rider he comes in as. Lee's aim is to push himself into the main part of the team. To have an experienced guy like him alongside Ace is also important. Ace has bags of talent. We agreed to his signing before the end of last year, and I'm glad we did that before his last meeting at Redcar. So many teams wanted him. It's great to have a Scottish rider in the team again. We would just like him to settle in with no pressure and, hopefully, pick up some points. For all their talent, Brown knows a little bit of luck will still be required to win the league. He said, We've come close. I think we would have won it in 2019 if Paul Stark hadn't got injured. Paul were just too good for us over the past two seasons. We maybe need a slice of luck with no key injuries at crucial times. But we will keep pushing to win it. That article was written by Brian Yule and read by me, Corey. Lisa signs pro contract after scoring winner in cup final. Lisa Forrest has celebrated scoring winner in the under-18s Scottish Cup final for Glasgow City earlier this month by signing a professional contract. Forrest joined City in March 2020 as part of the under-17s development squad before moving to the under-19s national performance squad. As well as being a regular for the under-18s this season, she has made five appearances for the first team and scored her first senior goal away to Dundee United on January 15th. Forrest told the club's website, I'm excited to have signed professionally with Glasgow City. I loved it here since I started. I can't wait to get the opportunity to play for the first team and learn from great players. I'm excited for my future here at City. Interim head coach Leanne Ross added, I am delighted to welcome Lisa Forrest to the Glasgow City first team squad. Lisa's progression in the first team is testament not only to her own ambition and hard work, but also to the fantastic work being done within our academy programme to develop our young team players. Lisa is an exciting young Scottish talent, who I have absolutely no doubt will thrive in our first team environment. I am really looking forward to working with Lisa and supporting her continued development at Glasgow City. City won 6-0 at home to Hamilton Ackies on Saturday to lead the SWPL1 by 5 points and be the first team to secure their place in the top 6. Priscilla Chinchilla and Jenna Clarkbooth grabbed a double in the first half, with Emily Whelan and Kenga Kozak also finding the net after the break. City face a tough test on Saturday as they travel to face Rangers at Broadwood. Rossville women went down 3-2 at home to championship leaders Livingston. The away side led 3-0 at half time as Beth McKay scored a brace either side of a goal from Brogan Anderson. Rossville came back strongly in the second half with a double from Mel Porter. But Livy saw out the final 10 minutes to grab the three points. West Park United lost 7-2 home to Harmony Row in the SWFL West. Rossville head to Ayrshire United on Sunday, while West Park are away to Drumchapel United. Thank you for listening to this week's Kirk and Tillichero podcast. Brought to you by Cune Review, Print Speaking to the Blind. If you have any feedback, you're welcome to call us on 0141 772 3976. If you enjoyed this recording, feel free to subscribe to our channel.